for you. Today, it could not have been a prettier day. We had sunshine. We had very pleasant temperatures, not much wind, and hardly a cloud in the sky. Hope you were able to enjoy this marvelous Monday. Things will likely change for us a little bit here over probably the next 72 hours or so. So we got another nice day tomorrow. 65 Hot Springs, 74 Roanoke, 73 Danville. It's 71 in Withville. Your forecast first. Showing temperatures tonight falling into the upper 40s and lower 50s. Highs tomorrow in the middle 80s. We're going to be mainly sunny again tomorrow. Maybe a few more clouds later in the day, but overall just much, much warmer as we head into Tuesday. 10 News at 5 starts right now. Live from WSLS, this is 10 News at 5, working for you. Now at 5, picking up the pieces. Cleanup continues after tornadoes whip across the region. In 20 seconds, it was over. It was like unbelievable. How people in the community are helping with the recovery as crews survey the damage. Plus, a neighborhood comes together after a Roanoke staple catches fire. I mean, it kind of hurts me that people that want to come here aren't going to be able to come here because we can't get open yet. The plans to get the community in back up and running as soon as possible. And a search for answers following a series of Easter Sunday suicide bombings. How U.S. leaders are responding to the deadly terror attacks in Sri Lanka. Well, good afternoon. At least 15 tornadoes touched down across the Commonwealth during Friday's severe weather outbreak. Tonight, several local communities are still working to reestablish their lives and routines, including people in Franklin County who were among the hardest hit. According to the National Weather Service, an EF3 tornado was on the ground for 8.2 miles and reached wind speeds up to 159 miles per hour. Three days ago, we introduced you to the Andersons, whose home was wiped out in the storm. 10 News reporter Jessica Jewell checked in with that family again today. In fact, she joins us now live from what is left of their home. Jessica. John, the past few days have certainly been nothing short of chaotic for the Anderson family as they try to come to terms with the fact that this is all that is left of the home they lived in for nearly 40 years. It's a home that's in a tight knit community where everybody knows everybody. So this disaster affected more than just this family, and now that community is coming together to support them in amazing ways. It bothers me. It does. It really bothers me. When your family gets hurt, you hurt. The EF3 tornado that swept through Franklin County Friday morning did more than uproot trees and destroy homes. It broke hearts. That's why hundreds of people have spent the past few days helping the Andersons try to pick up the pieces. They'll have to tear what's left of this home down and build a new one. But in the meantime, they've tried to salvage the items they could and the precious memories that made this house a home. And thanks to generous donors, they'll have at least $37,000 to help them rebuild. Still Monday, dozens of friends and family members stopped by to check on Larry and Dolores, including Larry's uncle Floyd, thankful that somehow no one was hurt. Material things can be replaced. You don't put a value on them, you put a value on your life. Dolores Anderson was inside the home at the time. In fact, she was hunkered down right under these steps. She had to grab onto a pole just to hang on as she felt the tornado sucking her home away. We talked to her today about those terrifying moments and how they plan to move forward. Hear that story coming up tonight on 10 News at 6. Live in Franklin County, I'm Jessica Jewell, 10 News, working for you. Cleanup efforts are also underway tonight in Bedford County. According to the National Weather Service, an EF1 tornado touched down almost three miles north of Thaxton. It reached an estimated maximum wind speed of 93 miles per hour. The tornado uprooted and snapped multiple trees. It also destroyed an outbuilding off Centennial Road. One homeowner on Sharp Mountain Road says he's looking at $5,000 worth of damage, but he's still waiting on his insurance company to come look at the property. Meanwhile, we have learned that the damage from Friday storm in Halifax County was not caused by a tornado, but rather what they call straight line winds. 10 News reporter Colter Anstett was there as crews from the National Weather Service surveyed the area. Ronnie Roller's property was one of several surveyed today. Taking a look at this building here beside me, you can probably imagine why. Thankfully, though, most of the damage was to trees and no one 
was hurt. A storage shed destroyed, an ATV damaged after being tossed around by 90 to 100 mile per hour straight line winds Friday afternoon. Property owner Ronnie Roller was inside his shop when the storm hit. I heard the noise that said like Woo. it was just rain and wind blowing and about that time stuff started flying by the end of the shop. Today he had his grandsons helping him clean up the damage. What did you do the first thing? You bent nails didn't you? You drove nails down and then we picked up trash didn't we? I had a friend of mine uh, send me a, a message said well I'm sorry about your bad luck. I told him I had good luck because my home wasn't damaged. <laughs> I didn't end up in the hospital at the funeral. Prior to surveying Roller's property, National Weather Service meteorologist Phil Heisel surveyed some downed trees along a nearby road. What I'm looking at is the pattern of the damage to determine if it's convergent with distance or divergent. He says information about the storm could prove to be very useful. If you look at the number of strong tornadoes, that's been fairly uh, consistent across the country uh, over the past several decades, whereas the number of individual tornadoes, no matter what their rating has uh, has increased and that's something we'll certainly be looking at uh, once we collect all this information. Roller estimates the damage to his property to be about $30,000 and he does plan to rebuild. In Halifax County, Coulter Anstad, 10 News, working for you. A new day brings an outpouring of support for a Roanoke landmark destroyed in a fire. The Roanoke Fire Marshal says improperly disposed smoking materials sparked the flames at Community Inn early yesterday morning. 10 News reporter Shane Dwyer is live in Grandin Village with our first look inside and how people are helping. Shane. Lindsay, you know, right now would be the time normally that people would be getting off work and coming to grab a drink at Community Inn, but tonight, sign on the door closed due to fire. Although, really, you can't tell there was a fire here except for the overwhelming smell of smoke and this piece of wood that they have here where some of the glass was blown out off front. But all the damage is in the back. This is the first look that we got this evening at the smoker's room in the back, and that's where the fire happened. It took the brunt of the damage. Community Inn is probably right up there with Texas Tavern in terms of how much Roanoke cherishes this place. To that end, so so many people want to help, so to make sure that these folks are taken care of. Tony Pierman is a friend of the family and recognized that fact, so he spearheaded a GoFundMe to give people a good place to donate. Insurance, no way they can cover all the lost revenue. And then you have the, the salaries and the wages of all the hourly workers. And also they, they subside off tips mostly. So the loss of income, even if it's for 30 days, but it'll probably be much longer than that, is, is a huge impact on, on all those individuals and their families. The family behind this bar has owned it for more than 40 years. They know they had a support system, but what they didn't know is how the support system would be that good. Now this family, again, it's been in their blood the entire time. So to see a loss like this is truly devastating, but there is one thing that is keeping them pushing through all this, and that is their customers and the other people and the support that they're receiving here in Grandin Village. I'm working on that part of the story, and we'll have it coming up tonight at 6. Live in Roanoke, Shane Dwyer, 10 News, working for you. Another big story today, the death toll from that wave of bombings across Sri Lanka on Easter Sunday has now increased to nearly 300. No one has claimed responsibility, but authorities have arrested two dozen people in connection with the attacks, and now the United States is offering some support as well. 10 News anchor Brittany McGraw shows us how Washington is responding. I spoke with the various government officials that we are working with Sri Lanka. Today, Washington reacting to a series of attacks that ripped through churches and hotels on Easter Sunday in Sri Lanka. What was supposed to be a joyful Easter Sunday was marred by a horrific wave of Islamic radical terror uh, bloodshed. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo confirming that radical Islam remains a threat and the FBI saying it is assisting in the investigation. Sadly, this evil exists in the world. Both Pompeo and President Donald Trump speaking to Sri Lanka's prime minister. The president pledging support to Sri Lanka in bringing the perpetrators to justice. And the leaders reaffirm their commitment to the fight against global terrorism. At least 290 people were killed Sunday and at least 500 more were hurt. Americans were among those killed, including a fifth grader from the Washington, D.C. area and a Denver, Colorado resident. We mourn the loved ones of the victims, some of whom we can confirm were indeed U.S. citizens. This is America's fight, too. Authorities have arrested at least 24 people in connection with the attacks, but the Secretary of State today making it clear that there's still more work to be done. We have to remain active and vigilant, and uh, it's going to require uh, attention. 
Brittany McGraw, 10 News, working for you. And a man is dead tonight after a crash in Campbell County. State police say Stuart Hogan was driving along Gladys Road last night when he ran off the highway and flipped his Jeep. The 60-year-old was thrown from the SUV and died at the scene. Another man in the car who was wearing a seatbelt was not seriously hurt. The investigation, investigation into the crash is ongoing. Traffic is now back to normal along Route 220 in Botetourt County tonight. This comes after a fiery tanker crash damaged the highway near Fincastle back in February. Two lanes are open in both directions where workers have been busy replacing a section of pipe that was destroyed. They've also been rebuilding the northbound lanes. Crews are planning to pave this week, so drivers should expect some daytime lane closures. No one was hurt in the fire. And happening now, discussion over a new road on Virginia Tech's campus. VDOT is holding a citizen information meeting to talk about plans for a new western perimeter road in Blacksburg. The nearly three-mile roadway would connect Price's Fork Road to Southgate Drive. It would include rerouting Duck Pond Drive, building a new road to the visitor center, and putting in some roundabouts plus new paths for cyclists and pedestrians. Local leaders say it will cut down on congestion as well. That meeting runs until 7 tonight at the Inn at Virginia Tech. Bradford University's merger with Jefferson College of Health Sciences in Roanoke is almost complete. The name for the new school, Radford University Carillion, and the new logo were revealed earlier today. Now, once the merger is complete, the school will be grouped into uh, Radford's health program. Jefferson College, which is owned by Carillion, hopes this will help feed their growing workforce. Everyone knows, understands the importance of it, understands the importance of building something here in Roanoke that is dedicated to healthcare education. Radford University Carillion will be the second largest nursing program in the Commonwealth. Still to come, a new report suggests Prince Harry and Meghan Markle could be moving abroad after the birth of their first child. The latest speculation surrounding the royal couple. But first, a live look at our downtown Roanoke Sky Cam, where it has been sunny, warm, and beautiful today. Mm -hmm. When you can expect maybe some wet weather to return, that's coming up after the break. Welcome back, friends. I'm Storm Team 10 meteorologist Jeff Hanowish. As we uh, do a little review as to what we saw on Friday, this is staggering, okay? In Virginia, on average per year, we get 18 tornado touchdowns. In one day, on Friday, we had 15, nine of which were EF zeros, three of which are EF ones, two EF twos, and of course, one EF three. Of course, that EF three was in Franklin County, right here in our viewing area. Now, Tornado history going back since 1950. Uh, the two areas that saw tornado touchdowns on Friday, Franklin County and also Bedford County. Franklin County, you've seen seven tornadoes with the strongest one that we've seen since 1950 happening on Friday. That was the EF3 that hit near Sontag and Sindersville. Bedford County, we've seen nine tornadoes since 1950. The strongest ones were EF2s back in 1996, 2002, and 2004. The EF3 tornadoes that we've seen in Virginia since 1950, three have been here in our viewing area. Of course, we have the one in Franklin County that happened on Friday, Elon in 2018, Evergreen in 2016, and then back in 1986, we had an EF3 tornado in Charlotte County and an EF3 tornado in Halifax County. And again, just to reiterate, this is a photo from Jamie Davis in Halifax County uh, near Mount Laurel Road. This was not a tornado that happened on Friday. This was straight line wind damage, estimated winds of 90 to 100 miles per hour. That is incredibly strong for straight line wind damage. The damage swath was a little bit over one mile and we had snapped and uprooted trees along with a little bit of damage as well. So a look now at our local satellite and radar composite showing that uh, it is very quiet outside today and we are very, very fortunate to have that happen after what we saw on Friday. Easter Sunday was beautiful, had mostly sunny skies, lots of sunshine for us today as well. As we look in time, future tracker showing that tonight looks to be fair. As we head into Tuesday, Tuesday will be a day where we start off with a lot of sunshine, maybe a few more clouds working their way in late on Tuesday afternoon. By later Tuesday night, we may have a stray shower or two north of the Roanoke Valley. So by midnight, 1 a.m., maybe 2 a.m., Tuesday night slash Wednesday morning, may have a stray shower or two towards the highlands. 
Otherwise, as we head into Wednesday, looks like we're going to be partly sunny. Maybe a stray shower early in the day towards the Mountain Empire and towards the New River Valley. Then we're dry midday, maybe another slight chance for a stray shower late on Wednesday along the North Carolina Virginia border. But for the most part, the next couple of days look pretty quiet. By Thursday, a better chance for some pop up showers, even a stray storm with the best chance for rain this week lying on Friday. Why? Because we're going to have a cold front crossing our neck of the woods. What that's going to do is provide us some scattered showers, perhaps even a few thunderstorms. But with this one, looks like the best chance for severe weather is going to stay well south of us. But it's something we're going to continue to monitor for you here at Storm Team 10. I think on Friday, if we were to have thunderstorms, these will be just your garden variety thunderstorms before we start to clear things out and see a lot more in the way of sunshine heading into Saturday. So your forecast for tonight, we're mostly clear. We're comfortably cool overnight lows 40s to near 50. Now as we head into the day tomorrow, we are looking at more sun than clouds. We're very warm highs in the mountains in the 70s. Everybody else 80 to 85. A very, very warm day Tuesday. Then we're back into the 70s Wednesday on stray shower chance Wednesday. Hit or miss showers, even a few storms Thursday, scattered showers and a few thunderstorms on Friday. Most of the weekend is dry until late Sunday when we may have a stray shower with another chance for rain heading into our neck of the woods by Monday. Can we just have more of today every day? Yeah, Rinse just more. Yeah. Let's do more. Wouldn't that be great if we could do that? Because mm -hmm. today was just spectacular. Now tomorrow looks to be a nice day too. Yes. It's just going to be significantly warmer. It's right. going to feel like summer out there. It but was, if we could just copy and paste, yes. mm -hmm. you know, just I mean, every day. Mm -hmm. I would love Shining, to do that. 75, mm -hmm. I'll take it. it it's perfect. Amazing. No humidity yeah. out right. there. Not much wind. Yeah. It was perfect. It's like living it was, in Hawaii. It was, yeah. There yeah. you go. <laughs> but we don't. For one day. <laughs> All right, well, today does mark a very important day for everyone on the planet as it is actually Earth Day. So we hope you got outside to enjoy. Earth Day is celebrated on April 22nd each year. It was started in 1970 after the idea was proposed by Wisconsin Senator Gaylord Nelson as a way to educate the country about the environment. 1970, also, by the way, the year that Congress created the Environmental Protection Agency and passed the Clean Air Act. And in 1995, Senator Nelson was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom for his role as Earth Day founder and his work on other environmental issues. And we do have a much cleaner Earth today mm -hmm. because of all those things. Hope you enjoy it. Yeah. Meanwhile, nearly two dozen people came together to celebrate Earth Day in Blacksburg. They stood, held signs, and chanted on North Main Street today, voicing opposition to companies who invest in fossil fuels. Yeah, most of them oppose construction of the Mountain Valley Pipeline, which passes through the New River Valley, and they're hoping to hold pro-environment protests weekly in the future. Coming up, the United States will soon break the record for the number of confirmed measles cases this year. What new data from the CDC is revealing and why the outbreak is so dangerous. Tonight, the measles outbreak is nearing record levels. According to the CDC, another 71 cases were reported across the U.S. last week, with 68 of them in New York City. Now, that brings this year's total to 626 in 22 states, but none in Virginia. Health officials say measles is a highly infectious virus that spreads through coughing and sneezing. Symptoms include fever, runny nose, cough, and a rash that can spread across your body. According to infectious disease experts, it's also possible for complications to develop like pneumonia, which can be severe. The other main complication that we worry about is acute encephalitis, which is a swelling of the brain, which has a very significant mortality rate. And those that survive that can certainly have some long lasting neurodevelopmental problems. Pretty scary stuff there. Experts say the rising number of cases is in part fueled by an anti vaccination movement. Well, this could be a major medical breakthrough that could help treat ALS patients. Scientists at St. Jude's Research Hospital have discovered enzymes that could play a counteractive role in degenerative neurological diseases. And while they were conducting the various tests, the team discovered that two specific enzymes can break down cell structures that kill muscle and brain cells. The next thing is to see whether in these types of models to stimulating ULK1 and ULK2 activity, um, you know, increase the lifespan or start to treat the pathology. More tests are needed to see if boosting these enzymes can make a difference in treating muscle and brain disorders. Here's a look at what's coming up tonight at 5.30, a uh, bewildering story out of Paris following the massive fire at Notre Dame Cathedral, the smallest official residence of the historic landmark, 
managed to survive the flames. Mm. Plus, two students at Danville Community College launched their first complete mobile video game. How long it took for them to complete the project? That's coming up later tonight on 10 News at 530. It's a lot of water. Meghan Markle and Prince Harry may be gearing up to leave Britain after the birth of their first child. Say it ain't so. so. Yeah. According to Britain's Sunny Times, plans are being drawn up for a move to Africa next year. The report says a British diplomat has proposed a plan for Prince Harry and his wife to take on a more international position that could build on their work for Britain and the Commonwealth. Two brothers are going in very different directions with their different roles. William is going to be king. Harry is at the moment trying to find exactly what role he's going to have. Now, Prince Harry has called Botswana his second home. He even took Meghan there for a date just a month after they met. But the palace says it's all just speculation. Well, given that it was my story and very well sourced, um, I think you can read in a lot to that. I think Africa is the, the preferred option. The Duchess of Sussex is expected to give birth at any time now, and the royal betting is already in full swing. Most people putting their money on the two having a little girl hmm. and naming her Diana. Oh, we shall see. I think everyone would be excited about that. I think they would. Yeah. Well, our 90 Minutes of News continues next. Please stay with us for 10 News at 530. Live from WSLS, this is 10 News at 530, working for you. Now at 5.30, hundreds dead, hundreds of others injured as the world mourns those killed in Sri Lanka. They were an assault on that beauty. They were an assault on the innocence of human life. And it is an incredibly sad day. The promises from the international community in the wake of these attacks. A pledge from police to find a killer they believe is hiding in plain sight. Brutally murdered two little girls, two children, only a coward would do such a thing. The new details released in an Indiana cold case. Plus, the president drops a lawsuit on the chairman House of the uh, House Oversight Committee, the subpoena that started the whole legal battle. Well, with people from America, England, and members of several other countries counted among the victims of the deadly Easter Sunday blasts in Sri Lanka, the international community is now getting in on the investigation. Leaders from several countries offering their condolences and their law enforcement. Interpol and the FBI have already been called in to help with the investigation. They're trying to sift through the evidence to find clues about who could have been behind the attack. The government has cited a little known domestic group uh, called National Chowheath Jamaat. It's known to have extremist ideology and some believe they must have had outside help to carry out the deadly attacks. We don't see that only a small organization in this country can do all that. There is all we are now investigating about the international support for them. 24 people have been arrested so far. There are also other concerns that Sri Lankan officials may have had prior warnings about the attacks. Police say the mother of a missing five-year-old is not talking to investigators. Five-year-old Andrew Frund, who also goes by AJ, disappeared from his Illinois home after going to bed last Wednesday night. The attorney for Joanne Cunningham, who is AJ's mother, says she doesn't know what happened to him and she's devastated. Investigators say they're confident he didn't just wander away from home. And authorities are hoping that newly released video and sound will help them catch the person who murdered two teenage girls. Delphi, Indiana authorities have released a new sketch of the suspect as well as video of the, uh, of the suspect walking across a railway bridge toward a 14-year-old Libby German and 13-year-old Abby Williams. Their bodies were found the next day just out of sight of that same bridge. The superintendent today says the police believe the killer is hiding in plain sight. What will those closest to you think of when they find out that you brutally murdered two little girls, two children? Only a coward would do such a thing. Police believe the killer lives or has lived right there in that town.
Turning now to your forecast, we had a day full of spring sunshine, great temperatures, and the thing is, tomorrow looks even better. Storm Team 10 Chief Meteorologist Jeff Hanowitz joins us now with a check of the forecast. Great way to start the week. Yeah, no doubt. It has been a beautiful Monday, and tomorrow looks to be even warmer than today. So therein lies some pretty good news. Let's head on over and show you what we're looking at here on the satellite and radar composite. And you will notice, friends, that it is dry outside. We're looking to stay dry here as we head into the overnight tonight. Even tomorrow, look at this. High temperatures will hit near 84 degrees. It's going to be a warm day tomorrow. It's going to be a mostly sunny day tomorrow. And even as we head into Wednesday, we're still looking at temperatures topping out in the middle 70s. May have a little more cloud cover around on Wednesday, but uh, overall still looks like Wednesday is going to be a pretty nice day to be outside with only a minimal chance for a stray shower or two. So as we look at future tracker overnight tonight, again, if we are to see a few clouds, they would be this evening into our westernmost counties. Otherwise, as we head into the day on Tuesday, we are looking at more sunshine than cloud cover and just uh, a day that's going to feel more like June out there as opposed to the mid to latter part of April. Enjoy it, Brittany. Another Democratic candidate may be joining the growing pool of 2020 presidential hopefuls and is rumored to be using a Virginia city for his launching point. Several news outlets citing unnamed sources say former Jamie Vice President Jamie Joe Biden is expected to launch his presidential campaign from Charlottesville. Biden has not responded to a tweet seeking confirmation. If the 76 year old joins the race, he would be the 21st Democrat to officially announce his candidacy. And the president is suing the chair of the House Oversight Committee after the chairman subpoenas the president's accountant asking for years of financial records. Earlier this month, the committee asked for the financial records of President Trump and the Trump Organization. The legal team for the president filed a complaint in federal court saying the subpoena seeks to investigate events that occurred before Trump was president and, quote, has no legitimate legislative purpose. The Supreme Court is agreeing to decide if federal job protections include sexual orientation and gender identity. At issue is federal law that bans sex discrimination in the workplace and if it protects gay and transgender employees from getting fired. Justices said Monday they will hear three cases, including that of a funeral director who says she was fired shortly after telling her boss she was transitioning. Lower courts have been split on the issue that is important to LGBT rights supporters seeking broader protections. And two more states are dumping Christopher Columbus. Vermont and Maine become the latest to join a growing number of cities uh, and states that are changing an October holiday. The legislatures of both states now passed bills changing it to, quote, Indigenous Peoples Day. Both bills now awaiting the signature of the governor. Notre Dame's smallest official residence, some 180,000 bees, somehow managed to survive the fire that consumed the cathedral's ancient wooden roof. A major surprise to the officials who thought they wouldn't have made it through, all of the hives survived. In 2013, three hives were installed on the roof of the stone room that joins the south end of the monument. The move was part of a Paris-wide initiative to boost declining bee numbers. Hives were also introduced above Paris's Gilded Opera. The cathedral's hives were lower than Notre Dame's main roof and the 19th century spire that burned and collapsed in last week's fire. Target is officially kicking off its car seat recycling. The retail giant's annual event will run every Monday through May 4th. Target says it'll accept and recycle all types of car seats, including those that are expired or damaged. Customers who turn in a car seat will receive a coupon good for 20% off a new car seat or other baby items. The coupon's good till May 11th. A creation from two Danville Community College students is now available on your cell phone. Why they say this is just the beginning. And some much needed sunshine, but you'll want to keep your umbrella handy. Storm Team 10 Chief Meteorologist Jeff Hanowich will be back after the break with a look at when we might get a little rain in the forecast. And here's a look at how stocks of local interest finish the day on Wall Street.
You are looking at a live picture from our Martinsville New College Institute sky cam. <laughs> Look at that blue sky. Wow, just a beautiful, beautiful start to the work week for us. All compliments of an area of high pressure that should be with us for one more day. Let's head on over now and show you what's ahead. Well, we're going to talk about the meteor shower that's going to be happening tonight. We're going to talk about a warming trend that is ahead for us, and we're going to talk also about some late week rain chances ahead too. Now this evening, nothing to worry about. You saw on the sky cam, just really nothing but sunshine. That means tonight we're going to be fair. We're going to be clear, and there is no chance for rain here as we head throughout the evening. Temperatures at 7, near 70, and then we fall into, uh, say, the uh, lower 60s by around 11 o'clock. As I just showed you on the radar, or as I just showed you on the tower cam, there's not hardly a cloud in the sky on the satellite and radar composite. You need to go up, say, towards Chicago, Milwaukee, also into New York City to find any sort of rain. These storm systems for now are going to stay to the north of us. So we're really not looking at any major rain chances until perhaps Friday. Now Thursday, there could be some hit or miss showers and a stray storm. Wednesday may have a stray shower, but it's Friday. That's going to probably be the wettest day of this work week. Future tracker showing overnight tonight being mostly clear. That will lead us to a mainly sunny day tomorrow. I do think that we're probably going to awaken to hardly any cloud cover in the sky, but as we head into tomorrow afternoon, it would not at all surprise you if we start to see just a few more clouds around. Then as we head into Tuesday night, may see a stray shower towards our northernmost county, say towards the highlands. A stray shower tomorrow night can't be ruled out. Even as we head into Wednesday, can't rule out a stray shower very early in the day, say towards the Mountain Empire. Otherwise, it looks like on Wednesday midday we're dry and partly sunny. Then as we head into late Wednesday, may have a stray shower or two right along the North Carolina-Virginia border. But the vast majority of us are still dry, even on our hump day. Which leads me to tell you good news tonight for the Lyrid meteor shower. Expecting to see 15 to 20 meteors per hour. Again, as we always say with any meteor shower, best place to be is a dark place. I always uh, say maybe the Blue Ridge Parkway because there's not a lot of ambient light there. Uh, the best viewing will be before dawn and you want to look mainly to the northeastern sky. The pollen count, oh yeah, it's been pretty high for us, no doubt, over the last couple of days, and it's going to stay high Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Now, by Friday, pollen count may go down. Why? Because that's our best chance for some rain, with the main allergens being oak, sweet gum, and birch. Now, as far as the winds are concerned, we have them anywhere between roughly uh, 3 and 14 miles per hour. Winds are a little bit stronger into the mountains, much, much weaker out towards the Piedmont. And as we look ahead uh, for the uh, day tomorrow, we are looking at winds primarily between about 4 and 10 miles per hour. So the wind should not play an important role in our forecast tomorrow either. It is 66 right now in Hot Springs, 72 in Withville, 73 in Danville. The next seven days look like this. 76 on Wednesday, middle 70s still on Thursday, low to mid 70s as we head into Friday and Saturday. Again, Thursday into Friday, we're going to have increasing rain chances, but not looking like a big deal. Hit or miss showers and thunderstorms both days. Maybe Friday looking a little wetter than Thursday. Saturday's completely dry. Maybe a stray shower late Sunday. Otherwise, a better chance for some pop-up showers, even a few storms next Monday. But that is not a bad seven-day forecast, and I feel fairly confident in saying right now, I don't think we're going to have any severe weather outbreaks over the next seven days. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yep. It yeah. seems like, or at least it feels like, this is the first time in a long time that mm -hmm. we've had a seven-day stretch that was pretty consistent with the temperatures, pretty mm -hmm. pleasant. No temperature roller coaster. Right. And it's all 70s. 70s and 80s. Yeah. The one, tomorrow's the only flying new one. Yeah, the 80s, yeah. mid, mid yeah. 80s. Is anybody complaining? We'll suffer that. We'll suffer that. Yeah. yeah. I don't see anybody Turn on the AC in your mm -hmm. car. Everything's good. <laughs> there you go. Right. It's going to feel like June. All right. Mm -hmm. Thanks so My much. My pleasure. Pain at the pump, you probably noticed that you're paying more per gallon. We'll explain some of the reasons why the price has gone up. A game created by two area college students has hit app stores nationwide, and this isn't the only thing the two Danville Community College students have made. 10 News reporter Cole Transdeck tells us more. Bar versus Blocks is easy to play, but Deshaun Singletary says it wasn't easy for he and fellow student Jeremiah Good to make. It was difficult to make at first because we knew nothing about coding. Good says he and Singletary worked on the game for about a year and a half. You control a bar um, and the objective is to dodge the incorrect colors and hit the correct colors. And um, every like level, the colors would change. Um, by the signs that appear. The two students hope people around the world will download and play the game. That makes me really excited. Yeah, excited. <laughs> yeah, and happy. Though. Makes it feel like, you know, you 
did something good. The launch of the game comes just a couple of months after Good and Singletary launched their game development company. They say all of this work is just a stepping stone. That help yeah. us for another career path and um, open up other doors and stuff like that too. Though. Yeah, for a non-related game, you know, products. Mm -hmm. Having accomplished so much at a young age is a confidence booster. It serves as an example that uh, you picture mind to it, you can achieve anything really. That includes more games. Good and Singletary are working on a game they hope to launch in a couple of months. In Danville, Colter Anstat, 10 News, working for you. Coming up tonight on 10 News at 6, the National Weather Service is still checking out the damage in our region from Friday's devastating tornadoes. We'll check in on the cleanup. And an Allegheny County deputy says he and his family are lucky to be alive. The warning that they have for families. That and more coming up tonight at 6. You've probably noticed gas prices are on their way up. In the past two weeks, prices have surged 13 cents, bringing the national average to just under three bucks. Among the reasons for the spike, an ethanol shortage from the Midwest and increasing crude oil costs. Summer travel season is upon us, and a lot of airlines have raised their checked baggage prices, so there's been a rise in services that will ship your luggage to your destination instead. Plus, you don't have to lug it around the airport, right? Sounds like something you want to try. Don't wait, but you do need to ship it several days ahead of your trip. Make sure you know what you're signing up for. Luggage specialists do focus solely on that, but familiar names like FedEx and UPS may be also offering plans, so something to look into. Experts say items that need to be checked on their own, like surfboards or bikes, could be something that you want to look into as well. Warmer weather can lead to a higher water bill, so here's a list of ways to save this summer. Consumer Reports recommends you update your appliances. Older models can use way more water than newer models. When it comes to using your dishwasher or washing clothes, make sure you're only doing full loads. And when it comes to outdoor water usage, try sweeping the dirt off your porch rather than washing it away. And make sure that your sprinkler isn't watering the sidewalk. A story of perseverance earns a Spotsylvania man a unique gift. Why deputies went way beyond after a theft. Deputies in Northern Virginia and Walmart teamed up to replace a man's stolen bicycle when they heard his story. Yeah, police learned that Mark Cunningham's bicycle was stolen while he was out just running an errand. He used that bicycle to get to work and walking to work was taking like two hours each way. Spotsylvania County deputies also learned that 15 years ago, this father of three was in a crash that left him in a coma for months and doctors expected he would never walk or talk again. But he proved them wrong. After hearing all of that, the Spotsylvania County Sheriff's Department joined with Walmart to get him a new bike and a gift card. I put God first. I put God first, definitely. So that just kind of touched our hearts that no matter what, he continued to work and continued to try and strive on. And there's the new bike. Cunningham says it takes 20 minutes to get to work on the new bicycle, and he says he plans to use the gift card to get the deputies a thank you gift. Absolutely gorgeous outside for us today with sunshine, very pleasant temperatures, and not a whole lot of wind, maybe a tad breezy towards the higher elevations. Other than that, we're seeing some rain in areas north of us. That rain is going to stay away from us for the time being. 68 in Lexington, 69 Covington, 75 Smith Mountain Lake, lower 70s with Phil, also into Blacksburg. Forecast first. Showing temperatures tonight falling into the upper 40s to near 50. Highs tomorrow, middle 80s. Much warmer tomorrow, partly to mostly sunny tomorrow. Another beautiful day in store for us tomorrow. We'll talk about rain chances though coming up in 15 minutes. 10 News at 6 starts right now. Live from WSLS, this is 10 News at 6 working for you. Now at six, a Franklin County family stands together after a tornado ripped their lives apart. When your family gets hurt, you hurt. How the community is also lending a helping hand. Plus surviving a silent killer. I thought I was dying. It was chaos. A local family describes the moments when they thought carbon monoxide poisoning was going to kill them. 
strengthened efforts to save a local landmark destroyed by a fire. How much money has been raised for Community Inn in less than 48 hours? A Franklin County community devastated by a powerful tornado Friday morning is now on the road to recovery. And that includes the Anderson family whose home is a total loss. We first introduced you to them just hours after their lives were literally turned upside down. Today, 10 News reporter Jessica Jewell caught up with them again. And she joins us now live from what's left of their home. Jessica. Lindsay, the Andersons are still trying to come to grips with losing their home of nearly 40 years in less than a minute. The tornado left a clear path of destruction, turning this home into shambles before knocking down all of these trees. Now, these are things that can and will be cleaned up, but the emotional scars may never heal. This is where I came out. I hid behind the steps. Four decades turning a house into a home, and it's gone in an instant. Oh my God. Where's my house? Yeah. Dolores Anderson still in shock over the disaster. I still, when I shut my eyes, I relive it. If I hear a little noise, I, it scares me. But thankful to be alive. Oh, I knew God had me. I knew he had me all the way. It's just lucky if my wife hadn't have been and went downstairs, I would have probably been having funeral plans instead of building books. While the Andersons are counting their blessings, they're also trying to figure out how to move forward. You get up and you take your clothes off and you wash them and you put them back on the next day because I don't know where all my clothes, I hadn't found them yet. But they're certainly not doing it alone. Well, no words can explain what this has done to the community. Hundreds of friends, family members, even strangers have spent the past few days helping them pick up the pieces. We take care of our home. We always have. And donating more than $37,000 to help them get back on their feet. What does that mean to you? Everything. We have always give to people. If we could share anything, we did it. So now I just feel like we're getting it back. The Andersons are still here tonight trying to salvage whatever they can of their home. While they're starting the process of rebuilding, they tell us they're going to stay at an old family home nearby. When I asked Larry where they were going to rebuild, he said he had lived here his entire life. This is home, and he's not going to let a tornado change that. They hope to move into their new home by the end of the year. Live in Franklin County, I'm Jessica Jewell, 10 News, working for you. Of course, when disaster strikes, first responders are the first to jump into action. During Friday's tornado, Franklin County medics Brian Ferguson and Billy Akers were driving back from another call and they got caught in the high winds. When we were returning from uh, Martinsville, we were headed to our main office in Rocky Mount. We had heard of the weather alerts. Checking all units, checking all units, be advised we are currently in a tornado warning until 11 o'clock for this area. Again, tornado warning until 11 o'clock. And as we were coming up the road, we were looking out towards the west, towards where the Storm activity looked like it was coming from, thinking it was further away. Yeah, we're coming right in it. Yeah. Trees are falling. Next thing you know, we're running right into it. Heavy wumble, truck shook side to side, and then the glass in the rear broke. The breeze started coming in. Right. Yeah. It just happened so quick that I was like, okay, this, we just went through a tornado, or a tornado just went through us. Can you imagine that? Now look at this. Both men escaped unharmed, and they were able to help another driver whose truck was crushed by a tree, as you can see in our picture here. That driver also was okay. Miracle. A Halifax County homeowner is getting a lot of support after straight line winds during Friday's storm caused tens of thousands of dollars in damage to his property. Thankfully, no one was hurt. 10 News reporter Coulter Anstad spoke to the man about the help he's been getting. This large tree you see down here behind me is just one of several all along the driveway leading up to Ronnie Roller's house here in Halifax County. Thankfully, though, when the storm rolled through on Friday, trees down like this made up the majority of the damage. There was a storage building, though, a large storage building near the house that was destroyed. Roller estimates the damage on his property here to be about $30,000. He does plan to rebuild that storage shed. He also had a couple of ATV 
SUVs or utility vehicles that were picked up and tossed around, some of which sustained damage during this storm. Roller says he is thankful to be alive and thankful for all of the help that he has received since the storm. Within 30 minutes, we had like four guys with pal saws in our driveway. It's unbelievable, you know. It, it uh, warmed my heart just to see that happen. So it's, uh, it uh, touched me. Roller's property was one of several surveyed by the National Weather Service today. In Halifax County, Coulter Anstat, 10 News, working for you. All right. Check this out, the tornado that ripped through Franklin County on Friday. Jeff, if I have this mm -hmm. correct, is the third strongest tornado in the United States so far this year? That is correct. And mind wow. you, we have mm -hmm. had more tornado warnings here mm -hmm. and more tornado touchdowns here in the Commonwealth than they have in Kansas, wow. Oklahoma, mm -hmm. Nebraska, Iowa. Gives wow. you a little bit yeah. of an idea of how active it has been for us here for about the last 45 to 60 days. I want to talk about that Halifax County uh, severe storm that moved through. Uh, the National Weather Service is now done with their survey. Uh, two different areas of Halifax County, both of which reporting straight line wind damage. No tornadoes, but still look at these numbers. Straight line wind damage near Nathalie, estimated 90 to 95 miles per hour. That's mm -hmm. as strong as that's as not a tornado. tornado. Yeah. That's yeah. not a tornado, but it's, it's strong. It's the strongest strong. one. Uh, the uh, damage swath was a little bit more than a half a mile with snapped and uprooted trees. Also, uh, they finished their uh, survey uh, a little bit farther south in Halifax County near Mount Laurel Road. Estimated wind there, 90 to 100 miles per hour. Damage swath of over a mile. More snapped, unrooted trees and quite a bit of damage with that as well. Uh, Virginia tornadoes, we had 15 on Friday. The average per year is 18. Wow. Nine of those were EF zeros. Three of those were EF ones, two EF twos, and of course the one EF three in Franklin County. Uh, of course, the Bedford County one was an EF one. Uh, since we really started keeping tabs on tornadoes since 1950. Franklin County has had seven tornadoes. The strongest one was the one that we had mm -hmm. on Friday. Uh, Bedford County has had nine tornadoes. EF2s are the strongest that they've seen in 1996, 2002, and also in 2004. We've had 34 EF3 tornadoes in the Commonwealth since 1950, five of which have been here in our neck of the woods. One in Elan in 2018, another one in Evergreen in 2016, and of course the one that uh, hit Franklin County in between Cindersville and Sontag uh, just on Friday. We had uh, two more in 1986 and another one in 1969, those in Halifax and Charlotte counties. And we were talking, I mean, it really is a miracle no one got hurt in Franklin mm -hmm. County on Friday. Uh, yeah, God was watching over them. Yeah. I mean, that's, it, I'm, I'm so relieved that nobody got hurt, but you see that damage and it's just sobering. It, mm -hmm. It's something that you would see um, in Alabama or, yeah. or in Kansas or in Oklahoma. Yep. Um, those, those tornadoes were something else. And, Thank goodness mm -hmm. the next couple of days look to be quiet. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Tonight, a Covington family of seven is recovering after what they describe as a near death experience, getting carbon monoxide poisoning inside their home. Everyone survived, but the high levels Wednesday night could have been deadly. New at 6, 10 News reporter Tommy Lopez talked to the family about the frantic, fearful moments. Matt Bowser thought he was watching his family die. Professionals that do this for a living say at those levels, we should all be dead. One daughter just happened to still be awake at 1130, working on homework. She went to tell her parents that she had a headache, blurred vision, and nausea. It was really scary. I didn't know what was going on. If she hadn't been awake, they fear none of them would have survived. Another daughter became lightheaded and fell down the stairs. I should have been dead. Like, there's no way somebody should have lived through that. And I saw her laying at the bottom of the steps. I thought she was dead. The chaos continued. Matt's wife, Tiffany, was bleeding unconscious in the bathroom. EMS crews got there within minutes. Family members think they were minutes away from dying. And it hit me then, and it's just like, how did we not die? How did we not die? This is something you'll never forget. I mean, it, and it puts in perspective. You can't smell carbon monoxide. You can't see it. Many non-electric appliances can cause the problem. This is the boiler that malfunctioned. Bowser is a um, chief deputy with the Allegheny I County Sheriff's Office. Even he didn't have detectors in his house. Now they have seven, and they're urging everyone else to get them. Because you can't detect it, it's, it's enormously dangerous. People sit in their house, they start to feel bad. They may feel like they have a flu, headache, dry mouth, things like that. The dog has officially got his first Easter candy. He ate Cole's Easter Bunny. The family is recovering today. Was it scary being in the hospital? Yeah, really scary. But the Easter Bunny came and saw you? Yeah, 
That made it a little better. They're thankful to have been able to celebrate the holiday. In Covington, I'm Tommy Lopez, 10 News, working for you. An outpouring of support for a Roanoke landmark destroyed in a fire. The Roanoke Fire Marshal says that improperly disposed smoking material sparked the flames at Community Inn early Sunday morning. <laughs> 10 News reporter Shane Pryor is live in Grand Village tonight uh, with more on this fire and what's going to happen in the future. Shane? Hey John, we slid over from 5 o'clock. We were at Community Inn. Now we are over at the Village Grill, which is a neighboring restaurant. And they've got a pretty good crowd out here for a Monday night. And you know, a number of the people that are out here tonight are coming out to specifically support Community Inn. Community Inn is obviously not able to employ any of their people right now. So Village Grill is letting their bartenders come over here and work and make some money. And they've also got a CI staple on the menu there. That is the Schoolhouse Pizza. All proceeds from that pizza sold here at the Village Grill will go directly to supporting Community Inn to rebuild building over there and helping to pay for those employees while they're not able to work. They still have their bills that they need to play. You know, people have been pouring out today uh, while we were over there earlier today. I knew we'd have good support, but not not the support we were getting. I knew there's always good people out there willing to help. But yeah, I, I never expected this much. I mean, all the Facebook messages I've been getting, text messages, it's it's heartwarming. It's unclear how long it will be before the bar can reopen. The good news is the front side of the bar doesn't have as much damage, so they're hoping they can at least open half of it. Other people in the neighborhood are also pitching in. Uh, the Village Grill nearby where we just saw Shane, they're letting the workers uh, work there so that uh, they can cook up some menu items and make some money and continue with their livelihood. And uh, Shane is working on that part of the story. We'll have more about it uh, tonight on 10 News at 11. Meanwhile, a local animal shelter is in urgent need. How you can help the Regional Center for Animal Care and Protection. The Regional Center for Animal Care and Protection, the pound, needs your help because it has reached its capacity for stray dogs. Shelter leaders say they've received a lot of dogs over the last two weeks and are encouraging people to come check the shelter if they're missing one. Since RCACP is an open intake shelter, it can't turn any stray animals away, so room must be made to accommodate all stray animals. Our responsibility is for the dogs that are coming in, um, which puts our dogs that are off stray hold or adoptable or in a relinquished at risk in the shelter. So we want people to understand that by leaving their dog here and not coming to get them, that you're putting both dogs in danger. So please come, please come and get your animal. The shelter also has several stray dogs that are available for adoption. Welcome back, friends. I'm Storm Team 10 meteorologist Jeff Hanowich. Beautiful day will lead to a very nice night. Hardly a cloud in the sky right now for us, and that's the way it's going to stay here as we head into easily the first half of the day tomorrow. So overnight tonight, we are looking very quiet. We're looking dry. Tuesday will be a day where we're mainly sunny. That said, I would not at all be surprised if tomorrow afternoon we start to see a few more clouds around. I think tomorrow is going to start out with bright blue skies, but in the afternoon we may start to see just a few more clouds around, but we're going to be dry during the daylight hours tomorrow. By tomorrow night, I cannot rule out a stray shower into our northernmost counties. Otherwise, Tuesday night, we're just going to start to see uh, those clouds continuing to thicken a little bit. And then as we head to Wednesday, that should be a day where we're partly sunny. Mix of clouds and sunshine for us on our hump day. Uh, maybe a stray shower, say, towards the Mountain Empire early in the day. Maybe a break midday. We're probably going to be dry Wednesday around lunchtime. And then later on Wednesday, we could have a stray shower or two right along the North Carolina Virginia border. So the chance for a stray shower or two, 20% as we head into Wednesday. However, that chance goes up to 30% on Thursday, up to 40% on Friday. So the chance for rain will increase for us here mid to late week, especially late week. This is all good news for the Lyrid meteor shower. Okay, that's happening tonight. 50 to 20 meteors per hour. Not the best show we've ever seen, but nevertheless, it's going to be pretty good. You want to go to a dark place, I always uh, maybe recommend the Blue Ridge Parkway simply because of the fact that there's not a lot of ambient light. Best viewing is before dawn, and you want to look mainly to the northeast. 
Here's our next storm system. It's a front. It's going to bring us some hit or miss showers, even a stray storm on Thursday. Better chances for some scattered showers, even a few thunderstorms on Friday. It's a progressive storm system, meaning it should be out of here as we head into Saturday. Saturday should be a mainly sunny day for us. So for tonight, we're mostly clear, cool overnight lows, 40s to near 50. For tomorrow, we are looking at more sun than clouds. A beautiful day, a warmer day. Highs in the mountains in the 70s, everybody else 80 to 85. We are in the 70s Wednesday on. Looks like the weekend's going to be dry Saturday, maybe a stray shower Sunday. Otherwise, most of us are dry really all weekend long with another chance for hit or miss thunder showers one week from today. Happy. All right, Jeff, the Redskins discussing the upcoming NFL draft and the rail yard dogs reflect on a highly successful season on the ice. Sports is next. Projects. Uh, you know, we needed a quarterback and uh, we was able to trade for for case. But that does not put us out the rim of picking a quarterback if it's one there that we like at 15. We don't know who's going to be there uh, at 15. We got some guys that we do like. And um, if, if those guys are there, that's a discussion that has to be had. And I'm sure uh, we'll come up and that's a possibility that would happen. Doug Williams not ruling out choosing a quarterback at 15, depending on who's there. The Redskins finished the season, you'll recall, with Josh Johnson at quarterback after both Alex Smith and Colt McCoy suffered broken legs. The Redskins have, the Redskins have since traded for Case Keenum, signed local product Josh Woodrum. Colt McCoy, Alex Smith both still very questionable at best because of the severity of their injuries. All right, Birmingham and Huntsville will meet in the SPHL President's Cup best of three finals beginning Friday. The dogs bowed out of the playoffs over the weekend in the semifinal round. Alyssa Ray looks back at their successful season. Hockey season has come to an end here in Roanoke, but the rail yard dogs are coming off the best season they've had in franchise history, advancing to the SBHL playoff semifinals before falling short to Birmingham on Saturday. In game three, the dogs were a period and a half from advancing to the President's Cup finals before the Bulls made a comeback to win six to four. In that third period, it was that four minute stretch after we went up four two, um, all the momentum in the world and we let them creep back in before the before the intermission. And I, and I think, uh, you know, that's what really hurt us. Fifth seed Roanoke kicked off their playoff run with an upset over number one seeded regular season champs Peoria in the challenger round. Obviously, be becoming the fifth seed, earning the fifth seed, and then the one seed picking us and knocking them off in the first round, you know, that just shows that any, any team can win on any given night. And uh, if you get the right group of guys, guys together, you can really do something special. As the dog's success grows, so does their popularity. The Berglund Center has been a hotbed for hockey fans. We love our fans. Uh, loudest, I'll say loudest in the SPHL. I think the best fans in the SPHL. Um, you know, we only had a crowd, I think it was a crowd of 16, 1700 at our first uh, playoff home game, but it was deafening in there. Um, the noise was incredible. It's a great place to play. Uh, just, you know, the passion. You go into some road, we'll go into some road games, and it's not even close to what we get here. And, you know, having that makes you want to play for it, definitely. The dogs finished with a record of 28, 24, and 4, the most wins in a single season in their three year history. In Roanoke, Alyssa Ray, 10 Sports. And one of Virginia's final four heroes, Kyle Guy, has made it official, official, official. According to his Twitter account, less than an hour ago, he won't be returning to Virginia. He remains in the NBA draft pool. He said, in part, saying goodbye twice is not easy. The Caps look to advance tonight. Game six of their playoff series against Carolina. The defending cup champs lead the series 3-2. The puck drops 7 p.m. from PNC Arena. Duke gets another five-star top 30 recruit. No surprise there. Carolina League has the night off. And Dale Jr.'s mom, Brenda Jackson, has passed away at the age of 65. Your three little words, one big highlight. Cut it out. Xander Bogarts, we know all about him. Line drive, but oh, nice play right there. Brandon Lau right there, elevating, knocking it down, and then the presence of mind to quickly get the ball to start the 